Do you want to do something to help our hurting nation? On September 26th, join Franklin Graham for a prayer march in Washington, D.C. from the Lincoln Memorial to the U.S. Capitol. Find out more on today's episode of A View from the Wall. Join I Am A Watchman Ministries Managing Editor Joe Kerr with co-host Dylan Burroughs, bringing you a fascinating discussion regarding the importance of Bible prophecy and Christian living today as it relates to our responsibility as believers to be watchmen. This is A View From The Wall. Welcome to A View From The Wall. This is Dylan Burroughs along with Joseph Kerr, and we have the special opportunity today to talk with someone who can share some insight into this event that we're discussing, the Prayer March 2020 with Franklin Graham. We'll be talking with Edward Graham here in a few moments, who is the grandson of the great evangelist Billy Graham and son of Franklin Graham, and we're excited to bring him to you. But first, we want to talk a little bit about the importance of prayer about this event and how you can be involved. And we, like you, are concerned about America and its future. We are at a pivotal time as a nation, and we know that in order to see things change, we must come to God in prayer and ask for His blessing, His intercession, and His will to be done. And that's what we're going to do today. And Joe, as we get started today, let's talk a little bit about what the event is to begin with and share a little bit about how people can be involved in it. First, help people to understand what we're talking about when we say there's a prayer event coming up September 26th in Washington, D.C. What's that all about? That is going to be a prayer march, and we'll talk more about that, but this is not a political rally or a protest. This is a day of prayer, and we're calling all churches and anybody who can be there individually, come as a group, come by yourself, come as your family, along with Franklin Graham and many others from across the nation. Uh, We're going to walk the entire length of the mall, starting at the Washington Monument, and walk all the way to the Capitol and then pray on the steps of the Capitol, but we'll be stopping along the way at various points and praying for specific things over particular buildings. All that entire length of the mall there is scattered, you know, government buildings and offices of all different kinds. So we'll be stopping along the way to pray for different parts of what's going on in our country. It's not just one big generic prayer over the nation. So it's going to be a very pointed, very specific time. And we know as people of God that our prayers shake heaven and God comes where he's invited. So this is an opportunity to bring God to Washington at a time when he's needed. Well, that's a great way to put it. And for those who may not have seen the announcement, we want to take a moment just to play the information from Franklin Graham himself for you. So take just a moment, listen, and we'll be right back. America is in trouble, it's in distress, uh, but we do have hope and that hope is in Almighty God. And we need to pray now more than ever, uh, than we've ever done in our life. Our communities are hurting, our people are divided, and there's fear and uncertainty all around us. So let's join together and do the most important thing, and that is to pray. On September the 26th, I'm holding a prayer march in Washington, D.C. We're gonna start at the Lincoln Memorial, march all the way through the entire mall, pause in to pray at different key locations, and we'll end up in front of the Capitol. And we're gonna pray for this nation, we're gonna pray for its leaders, and we're going to pray that God will intervene and save this nation. And we're going to do this in Jesus' name. So join me. This is the prayer march, Washington, D.C., on the 26th of September. God bless. See you there. As you can tell, this is going to be a very special time for those around our nation who are looking to God for help during this special time in our nation's history. And as we've discussed, the Bible talks about the importance of prayer. And one place that we go to many times when we're talking about the importance of prayer in our nation is Second Chronicles 7, 14. I want to take just a moment to read that verse and talk about it in a moment. It says, If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. This is something that took place in the nation of Israel, and yet it has so much application to us today. And Joe, as we look at this, uh, I'm struck by this idea that it begins with humility, that we must humble ourselves when we pray. Talk a little bit about the importance of our approach to God as we pray. It's not just the words we say, but our attitude in coming to Him. 
I'm using a Bible that I got for this year, the Prayer for Our Nation Bible. And this morning's devotion, it couldn't have been more perfect, is from Psalm 33, where it says, We put our hope in the Lord. He is our help and our shield. In Him our hearts rejoice, for we trust in His holy name. What joy for the nation whose God is the Lord, whose people He has chosen as His inheritance. That doesn't just apply to Israel and to David. That applies to us. And as we welcome God's presence into our personal lives, into our families, into our church, and in this case, into the nation's capital, we can anticipate God coming where he's invited and doing what only God can do. As you look at that passage, it talks about humbling ourselves as we pray to the Lord, but also to seek his face, to turn from our wicked ways, and then the Lord will hear from heaven, forgive their sin, and heal their land. I know for my own life it's easy to pray and not take the time to confess our wrongs, our sins, our shortcomings before the Lord, but there is an important role that we must play in confessing our sins. The personal sins we have committed before the Lord that we confess those and he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let me ask you for a moment, when is the last time you've confessed your sins before the Lord? If it's been a while, let me encourage you to take a moment and confess your wrongs before the Lord and to humble yourselves as you pray for the needs of yourself, for your family, and for our nation. We have just a moment before our break, but I want to encourage you that when we return, we're going to look at the importance of this event from the top down, talking with the grandson of Billy Graham, whose name is Edward Graham. He's vice president with Samaritan's Purse. He's the son of Franklin Graham, and he's also a veteran of our military, our armed forces here in the United States. So he has a lot of authority, a lot of experiences, a lot of encouragement to share. But as we go to our break, let me leave this thought with you. If you've ever wanted to make a difference in our nation, the most important time is now. And if you've ever wanted to know how to make a difference in our nation, prayer is the way to do so. So keep that in mind. And as we come back, we'll talk more about the importance of prayer and this prayer in Washington on September 26th. We'll be right back. From I Am A Watchman Ministries, here's today's I Am A Watchman Minute. Being willing to step out for God and do the unusual is a mark of spiritual maturity. Consider the prophet Ezekiel. He was the son of a priest from a very distinguished family, but God told Ezekiel to do things that many thought were undignified. For example, in his preaching, he utilized drama and shadow puppets and miniature props. He cut his hair and burned some and buried some and threw some to the wind. Once he allowed himself to be tied up for 430 days. He was radical for God, but also righteous before God. Ezekiel was a watchman, and watchmen faithfully follow God's leading, period. The I'm a Watchman ministry is here to help you grow in Christ, and as he leads, be radical for God. Are you willing to be radical for God? Be bold. Be faithful. Be a watchman. Iamawatchman.com Welcome back to A View from the Wall. This is Dylan and Joe, and we've been talking about the prayer in Washington that is coming up with Franklin Graham and their ministry on September 26th. It won't just be Franklin Graham, but many from around the nation who will participate in this event. And if you look at the media, you're starting to see many from different backgrounds who are going to be part of this. Ronnie Floyd, for example, the president and CEO of the Southern Baptist Convention's Executive Committee, has said that he is encouraging the event and for everyone to attend who can possibly be part. And as well as Jack Graham, who's no relation to Franklin Graham, who is the pastor of Prestonwood Baptist Church, who is encouraging everyone within the Southern Baptist Convention and beyond to attend. And we're trying to do all we can to get the word out to you, to your church, and to those around our nation. So help us out. Share this program with those as you can and spread the information so everyone possible in our nation can be part of the special day of prayer September 26th in Washington, D.C. from noon until 2 p.m. Eastern time as we pray on behalf of our nation. And Joe, I'm excited about our guest today because it's a rare treat to be able to talk with someone who's both served in our armed forces as well as has this background of spiritual legacy with Billy Graham and his family like they do. Tell us a little bit about our guest today. We're excited to have Edward Graham. Edward is a veteran and was part of uh, the 
special forces units and has served his country honorably, but we are excited to have him representing the Billy Graham Association and talking specifically about this march and about what his father has called America to prayer, like his grandfather did on a number of occasions over the years that he was an influence on this country. And we're excited to have Edward Graham with us. We're glad you can make a few minutes for us here this morning. Well, thank you. Appreciate you having us on today. Tell us why there is such an importance for a march in our nation's capital right now. I mean, I think you can just look at TV and social media alone, but there is just, there's fear. There's fear gripped with this virus. There's uncertainty mm-hmm. about an election, but there's just a nastiness in politics and in people's dialogue on social media within the news that in my lifetime, I don't know if I've seen, um, and it's just there's some trouble, and I think people are fearful and uncertain to that, and Dad wants to call people back to prayer, to ask for revival, to get on their knees and to pray for this country, to pray for this election that's coming up, praying for, you know, a healing of heart, and only a healing that Jesus Christ can bring about. Edward, thank you for clarifying that it's a prayer march. This is not a political event or in support of a particular party or candidate. This is is a prayer event. Why should people attend and what should they expect? Well, no man or no political party can fix this and to fix the, the hate in the human heart and the brokenness. Only Christ can. And so this is all this is. This is just a, a, a gathering of Christians, the body of Christ, the church, all denominations, all walks of, uh, of followers of Christ. We're asking just to come and to pray for this healing and the healing of this nation. And as and Scripture tells us to, we get so many examples from Scripture of exactly what to do in times of this and times of uh, a trouble. I look at even Jesus. And, you know, when he went into the garden, the night before he was to be, he knew what was coming. Uh, He knew the pain and the turmoil, the rejection that was coming. He had a heavy heart. And what did he do? He prayed to his father. And uh, he even asked his disciples to pray with him. Now, they didn't. They they were supposed to stand watch, and they fell asleep. They fell asleep. And I don't want to be a church. My father doesn't want to be the church that falls asleep during a time like this that we need to lift each other up, to lift this nation up, to lift up our leaders. Scripture tells us to pray for our leaders, and that's what my father wants to do, just wants to go up there and to walk around and to pray. It's no protest, and it goes to no political party. Like I said, no political party. The Democrats, the Republicans, they can't fix this problem. Only Christ. Well, that's so well said. And at strategic moments in American history, presidents, leaders, your grandfather, Dr. Billy Graham, and others have called America to prayer. How have those calls to prayer affected the country in the past, and how do you hope to see something similar in our nation today? Yeah, I, I can remember my own lifetime. I was a cadet at West Point when 9-11 happened. And I can remember my grandfather praying at the National Cathedral. And what he asked for in this country was us to pray, and to pray for our leadership and where our nation was. He knew we were a nation about to head to war, and he wanted to pray for that. He also wanted to pray for reconciliation and revival in the church. That's what this nation needed. And recently, I went back and I listened to that speech. I listened to what he what he asked for and what he prayed for. It is no different then, after 9-11, when we were scared, we were fearful, we were hurt. But as a country, we were united then. And you can remember the, the Congress coming on and, and singing on the steps together, God Bless America. They did that as a group. But we don't have that right now, that unity. There's a hatred towards each other. And it's, it's my hope that we come together as a nation, going back and looking at that speech and listening to it, that we pray for revival and hope. That's the same prayer here. And, they, and leaders have been doing that all the time throughout history. And uh, one of the stops that we're going to go to is the Lincoln Memorial. And I think about the Gettysburg Address, and I think about what Lincoln had to do to rebuild a nation that was broken, destroyed. We think we're hurt and broken now. This nation has been to war with each other and killed brothers. That time was worse. As a nation, we think we're hurting. What do you think it was like for a Jew in the 1930s and and the despair that they had? Evil has always been here. But as a nation, we're called to get on our knees and pray and that's exactly what we need to do now. We're heading towards some even darker times 
if we don't get revival quickly. We know the Bible talks about us praying individually, praying for our families, praying for our church. What does the Bible say specifically about praying for our nation? You know, we, I, I've already mentioned that it, it asks us to pray specifically for our leaders. Um, you know, I, I think I'll, I look often back, and one of the stops that we're going to pray for here again this time is that uh, when we see the White House, we're going to pray for the position of the president and the vice president. But I think how God has used number two, and in my prayer life, I often pray for the vice president, because look how God used Daniel and Joseph, number twos in their kingdom. Um, and, and Scripture clearly shows how God used these number twos to influence the kings at the time to save the nation of Israel. God had a plan and a purpose, and he used it. So I even pray for the office of the vice president. But we look, and I think of, uh, you know, First Timothy uh, it's chapter 2, verses 1 through 2, but it says, I urge them, first of all, that petitions and prayers and intercession and thanksgiving be made for all people, for kings and those in authority, that we may live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. It tells us right there, pray for the kings and those in authority. Pray for the president. Pray for Congress, regardless of political party or, or affiliation. You pray for them, that they seek godly wisdom, that they get on their knees and uh, quiet lives and all godliness and holiness. And really the theme of this march is Second Samuel. And that comes out of 24 and 25. Thus the Lord was moved by prayer for the land. David had sinned. And Dave had to, David had to pay for the consequences of that sin. And there was a great plague that came over the land. And God stopped it. He stopped the angel and the plague and the killing of people. But there was a judgment. Yet David was moved to prayer, got on his knees, asked for repentance, and God heard that prayer and restored the land and restored the kingdom of David. Well, that is wonderful, and we want to thank you for your service to our armed forces. And there are so many in our nation who have served, who are veterans, who are family members of those who have served, and they, they each play such an important role in our nation today. And I love the discussion we're having. We'll be right back with more here on A View From The Wall. The Bible predicts the rapture of the church is coming. Are you ready? Soon many will be caught up to meet the Lord in the air. Only they will escape the dark days that are coming, a time of tribulation that will usher in the Antichrist and great destruction upon the entire earth. There's only one escape, one way, one light, one truth. His name is Jesus. He came and died so that we may live forever with Him. But to receive this new life, there are three things we must do the ABCs of salvation. A, admit you're a sinner and that you need a savior. Ask for forgiveness and receive his grace. B, believe that Jesus is the Son of God, that he came, lived, died, rose again, and will come again. Believe that he is Lord and God. C, commit to walk his path, the path he wants you to walk, and walk it out by faith. Then you'll be ready for the return of the Lord. To learn more about the rapture and how to know for sure, visit amiraptureready.org. Welcome back to A View From The Wall. This is Dylan and Joe, and we're talking with Edward Graham, the assistant to the vice president of programs and government relations at Samaritan's Purse. And we are enjoying our conversation today, talking about the prayer March 2020 in Washington, D.C. And clearly America needs hope and healing now more than ever. We look at 2020 and the unprecedented events that have taken place with the virus, with the civil unrest, with many churches still being closed. And it discourages me when sometimes you hear those who are skeptics who say, our thoughts and prayers are not enough. We need something more. And I think, well, prayer is the action. Prayer does change things. And I want you to take just a moment to encourage those who question whether prayer is enough in terms of making change in our society today. Prayer, I'm going to tell you right now, prayer is enough. I'm a product of prayer, and I'm here today because of prayer and the power of prayer. I have seen many mm -hmm. miracles in combat. Um, I saw miracles at West Point, because I'll tell you right now, I'm not an academic powerhouse. 
and uh, probably should have been removed a long time ago from that institution. But I, I got I got through that on my knees and praying. Um, but as I look, and I look throughout history, and when countries came through revival and parts of the Great Awakening here in America, and what God has used just America for, but other, other nations and the nation of Israel, and how God has used that and His people, prayer, it tells us in Thessalonians, Pray without ceasing, without ceasing, continuously talking to God, letting your petitions be known to him and giving it to him. See, I learned in the military, I couldn't do it on my own. I also learned that no man was going to save you, that there was no person, no party, no individual, no group, collective was powerful enough. I had to learn early on the power of surrender and giving that up. I gave it over to the Lord. There were things too big in my life to understand. I don't deal to this day with PTSD or issues with the things I saw that I was a part of within the special operations community because I learned I had to give it up, to give it over to the Lord. And that's what this prayer, this is what prayer is, that we get on our knees, surrender it to the Lord and say, Lord, the problems of this nation, the problems of this world, this sin is too great. No man, no political party can solve these problems. We hand it over to you. We ask for your guidance and your wisdom. And I promise you, prayer is enough. God hears it just like he did with David. He heard those prayers, those petitions. People were dying. The nation of Israel was dying. The kingdom of David was dying. David got on his knees. His men got on his knees. God heard those prayers, and again, it was restored. So that's exactly what we can do here today, and I am here to tell you that I'm a firm believer in the power of prayer, and it will work. We definitely want to encourage all of our listeners and pastors who are listening right now to encourage your churches to participate and attend this event on September 26th. But what about those who can't attend, Edward? What can they do? Yeah, we appreciate it. So on September 26th, and then we would love for you to be there and to show up and walk in person. But if you can't, if it's too far away, well, during that time, commit to pray. Get in groups. God tells us to get in fellowship and to pray with one another, to pray in groups, to lift up. So get with your prayer group, get with your Bible study, your small group, your church. And as a nation, let's pray together at the same time, lifting up our needs and committing them, and like I said, surrendering to the Lord. If you want more information, you can visit billygram.org. I go to the website, they'll have information on this, but we would love for you just to be praying at that same time. Well, Edward, we appreciate your time with us and all the work that you do with Samaritan's Purse and with the Billy Graham organization. And as we wrap up our time together, talking about the Washington 2020 Prayer March with Franklin Graham, we'd like you to take just a moment today as we're together on the radio with so many who are listening to pray in advance of this event to encourage people to participate, to pray for our nation, and to be part of what God is doing during these extraordinary times. If you would lead us in prayer as we end our time together. I appreciate this opportunity, and this is what I want to do most is pray. So let's do this. Lord, we come to you today. Lord, we surrender to you. We give over our burdens, our hearts, our frustrations, everything that we struggle with in sin. We come to you and we ask for forgiveness. I ask for forgiveness for my own faults, my own wrongdoings, my own selfishness. But Lord, as a nation, the brokenness we've seen with social injustice and upheaval, the rioting, the destruction, the killing of people and of innocent people. Lord, a nation that is supporting abortion and the destruction of innocent lives. Lord, now we know you can't be a part of that and you have to reject it. But Lord, we commit this nation, our leaders to you. We ask for repentance. Lord, we ask that you speak to our leaders, that you give them wisdom, that they seek you, get on their knees and seek direction and guidance from you daily and all that they do, we ask that this nation can be a great light for Scripture and for the gospel, that we're a tool and instrument that can go around the world and share the gospel of Jesus Christ. Lord, we're a nation that believes in the freedom of religion, the freedom of worship, to be able to come and worship how we choose. Free will, Lord. And that is the gift that you've given us. But we pray that we remain a nation that supports that, and fight for it. And Lord, I pray as a church, as a body of Christ, that we remain bold and go faithfully where no one else will go, stand where no one else will stand. And Lord, that we commit everything to you 
and in prayer and petition. As this prayer march comes up, Lord, let it be your word, not my father's, not any man, not any woman. Lord, that your word, your will be done. We commit and surrender to you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. And thank you, Edward, for being with us. And for more, you can go to billygram.org. Again, thank you for being with us. We'll do all we can to help support the event and get the word out about it. Thank you so much. And we appreciate it. And a good talk to you. Edward Graham is the youngest son of Franklin and Jane Graham, and he is serving as assistant to the vice president of Operation Christmas Child for Samaritan's Purse. He graduated from the U.S. Military Academy, where he served 16 years in the U.S. Army. And after multiple combat deployments within special operations and serving in various leadership positions, he felt called by the Lord to return home and serve in the ministry starting in the winter of 2018. Edward and his wife, Christy, have been married 14 years and have one daughter and three sons, and they're raising their four children in the mountains of North Carolina. Thanks so much for that time of prayer, Edward. We really appreciate it. And for all of you who are listening today, we encourage you to go to IamAWatchman.com and to listen again and get more of our resources. We'll also include the links to the prayer event, and you can also go to BillyGraham.org to get information there. Thanks so much for joining us. We look forward to being with you again on A View from the Wall. A View from the Wall, in association with I Am a Watchman Ministries, exists to equip a worldwide audience with biblical truth, sharing it with others, and being prepared for Christ's imminent return. The team seeks to encourage, inspire, and equip watchmen for such a time as this. For information about the ministry and upcoming events, visit IamAWatchman.com. A View from the Wall is made possible by the team of dedicated pastors, editors, and the many contributors of I Am A Watchman Ministries. To support our efforts, give online at IamAWatchman.com and click on the Donate button. Thanks for listening, and join us again next time on A View from the Wall.